receiving a the MSK portion of your MSI review session. Um, the way that I've gone about this is the same way that I went about the CBP session, which um, is basically I'm, I'm going to give you a question, and then I'm going to give kind of like a summary slide afterwards on like the disease, some important parts about the disease, you know, some things that I find high yield and whatnot. Mm. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or unmute up to you. Um, I'm going to give you guys a few seconds or like a minute or two to read the question. Then I'll go over with you guys, go over the answer as well. Okay, um, let's get started. Okay, so a 16-year-old man comes to the position because of five months history of undulating dull pain in his right thigh. Physical exam shows a tender round mass located above the right knee on the anterior aspect of the thigh. Uh, an x-ray shows sunburst pattern of osteolytic bone lesion in combination with chlorotic bone formation and invasion of the surrounding tissue. Despite limb spinning attempts, the patient has to undergo amputation. A photograph of a cross section of the affected limb is shown, of, like is shown, which of the following is the strongest predisposing factor for this patient's condition. What do you think the answer is? First of all, what do we think that this disease is over here? Okay, so um, this disease right here, if we see five months of undulating, meaning pain comes and goes, um, with a tender round mass above the right knee at the anterior aspect of the thigh. Okay, now the thing we want to kind of look out for here is the x ray findings over here, which says sunburst appearance with osteolytic bone lesions and a squatted bone, right? So the sunburst appearance is characteristic of uh, osteosarcoma. Some of you said in the chat. And so one of the largest or one of the strongest predisposing factors in general for osteosarcoma is a patched disease of the bone. Um, it's a very important association um, because in patients with patched disease, this is something you want to look out for. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this? Questions? Okay. Um, let's move on to the next question. Okay. I'll just read it. A 14 year old boy is brought to the physician by his mother because of a one month history of pain in his right leg. His mother has been giving him ketorolac at night to improve his sleep, but the pain has not improved. Physical examination shows marked tenderness along the mid right mid femur. An X-ray of the right lower extremity shows several lytic lesions in the diaphysis of the femur and a surrounding cortex covered by several layers of knee bone. Biopsy of the right femur shows small round blue cells, which are the following's most likely diagnosis. Okay, so one of the important parts of this is for the demographic, the young boy. Okay, um, is he having chronic pain in his right leg? Uh, no, it does not improve. Uh, with uh, NSAIDs. And there's marked tenderness along the right mid femur. Specifically, it says diaphysis. Okay. The x ray shows lytic lesions and surrounding cortex covered by several layers of new bone. And then, of course, obviously the biopsy, small round blue cells. So, as you guys have said already, the answer here is even sarcoma. Um, can someone tell me what these findings are? Especially this one. Onion do, do you, yeah, onion skin appearance. Um, do you know what the translocation, the important translocation for this is? 1112. Close. 1122. I was actually, yeah. So that was the answer C over here was even sarcoma. So 1122 is an important translocation. Um, 
So just like a brief summary on the malignant bone tumors. Okay, important to know where they occur because that can kind of um, help decrease the differentials in your mind. So if it's in the aphysis, your differentials will be different. If it's in the epiphysis or metaphysis, obviously your differentials will be different, right? Um, now, I would follow whatever is written in your lectures in terms of like what is part of the aphysis, what is part of the metaphysis and so on and so forth. But some things that are consistent throughout is you want to look for a demographic, right? So in osteosarcoma, oftentimes there'll be young patients. Similarly, in UA sarcoma, they'll be young, but they'll be even younger oftentimes. So our patient was 14. Um, and then chondrosarcoma, which is another multi bone tumor, mostly seen in middle age, right? Um, appearance is very important. So obviously in osteosarcoma, we see the sunburst appearance and we see the cognitive triangle, okay? And then it very often metastasizes to the lungs. So that's something that I could ask you as well. Uh, additionally, you and sarcoma, as you mentioned, small round blue cells, which um, also comes with onion skinning. Uh, and then translocation 1122. Uh, additionally, one other thing is that um, you and sarcoma kind of differentiates or kind of resembles lymphocytes on histology. So it's really important that you also look for the translocation to confirm. Um, this alchondrosarcoma is seen secondary to osteochondroma and echondromatosis. So these kind of like diseases. These are things that are pretty easy to ask um, questions about. Doesn't Ewing present with infection symptoms? Well, it doesn't have to. Um, I think like this, okay, maybe this question might not be as detailed um, as what you might get. I mean, hopefully you guys get a lot of detail, but it doesn't have to have um, like fever and whatnot. These are like B symptoms, that's what they're known as. Um, Oftentimes, this is all they'll give you. And then just based on the information you're given and the fact that it cannot be any of the other answers um, should lead you towards you and sarcoma. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the question, okay. Um, actually, so for this question, uh, I don't really like to do pharma questions because I don't really, like the way that they teach pharmacology, I don't really enjoy it. I don't really like it. All I want you guys to tell me from this is what the drug is and what are some important adverse effects of this drug, okay? So a 72-year-old man comes to emergency room because of 40 history of progressively worsening pain and swelling on the right side of his face. Patient was diagnosed with multiple myeloma eight months ago and is currently undergoing treatment. Without a signs of the normal movements, physical exam shows erythema and swelling over the right cheek and mandible. An oral facial fistula is present, which the following best describes. Okay, so first of all, what does anyone know what um, drug he was given here? Okay, so the I'll give you I'll give you a hint. Uh, the condition that he's presenting with is osteonecrosis of the jaw. So, which of the drugs that you have taken can cause osteonecrosis of the jaw? Okay, yeah. So, the answer here is bisphosphonates. Uh, and then the answer for this specific question is E, binding to hydroxy appetite, but I'm not really sure how 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 much they stressed on it in your in your lectures. I know that they kind of give different um I think here I have it here. They kind of give different types of um bisphosphonates and stuff like that. In my opinion, it's not that high yield, but it's important for your exams, therefore I have put it here. Um imagine the more important parts is um the adverse effects effects here, also necrosis of the jaw and esophagitis. Um, uh, also, uh, I think a lot of the time in the university exams, the answer choice that they like to put as the mechanism action is, you know, in inhibi inhibition of lipid modifications or, or some something along those lines. So I'd look out for those kind of answers. Um, and so because of this esophagitis, this is why they tell them, like, oh, don't lie down and try to stay upright for 30 minutes after, after having this. It's a very important side effect.
Uh, does anyone have any questions about those? <clears throat> okay, move on then. Okay, <clears throat> a 40 year old woman comes to the physician for a two month history of chest pain and heartburn after meals. The patient reports that the pain is worse at night and especially when lying down. There's a history of occasional small joint pain and renal disease treated with nifedipine. There's no family history of serious illness. She immigrated to the US from Nigeria five years ago. She does not smoke or drink. Uh, vital signs are normal. The cardiopulmonary examination shows no abnormalities. Thickening and hardening of the skin is seen on the hands and face. There are several firm white nodules on elbows and fingertips for the evaluation is most likely to show which of the following findings. So what do we think the answers are? Okay, you guys are correct that it is scleroderma. Now, what antibody, so when you think about scleroderma, there are two types of scleroderma, which I'll get into, but there's the diffuse type and then there's the limited type, right? So for the limited type, what we wanna look for is the signs of Crest syndrome. Have you guys heard of that? So, Crest syndrome. I don't think we can scleroderma this. Um, Did you not take it in mm -hmm. clinical? You didn't take you guys didn't take on it mm -hmm. at all. Okay. Yeah, we because didn't okay, no problem. Well, we'll move on from this because I remember for us we never got a pathology lecture on this, but we took it in clinical and it still came as a lot of MCQs as well came as a lot of SAQs. Uh, it came as an SAQ as well. So if you guys didn't take it though, that's fine. Yeah, no worries. Move on, move on from that. But just 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 for you guys' information, um the answer here is D for anti-centromere antibodies, because um what we saw is the typical crest syndrome, calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyl, and splenectasia. Um, but it's, if you guys didn't take it, then it's not important. We'll move on to the next thing. Okay. <clears throat> a 26 year old African American woman comes to the physician because of a three week history of a non productive cough and chest pain. Uh, the pain is sharp and worse when she inhales deeply. During this time, she also has two episode episodes of hematuria. Over the past six months, she has had intermittent pain, stiffness, and swelling in her fingers on her left knee. She's had two miscarriages at 22 and 24. Her only medication is minocycline for acne vulgaris. Her temperature is 38. 75, blood pressure is 138 over 85. Physical exam shows an erythematous rash on her face. There is mild tenderness over the metacarpal pharyngeal joints, bilaterally with no warmth or erythema. Further evaluation of this patient is most, like, most likely to show which of the following findings. What do you think this is? Okay. Yeah. So the answer here is B, anti Smith antibodies. So well, some of the things I want to look at here is uh, actually, let me go here. Well, SLE, obviously, autoimmune disease, right? Type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Um, lupus nephritis is important sequelae of, um, of SLE because it's the most common cause of death. It's associated with DS DNA and anti Smith. If they ask you, which they seem to like, like asking, which is more specific, then the answer is Nancy Smith. Um, now, some of the things you want to look out for in the question, you want to look for any of these rash or pain symptoms, okay? Um, which you can read here. Uh, and then if you see like, if you see four or more of these, then the answer is uh, SLE, okay? So what do we see here? We see, um, we see chest pain that's sharp and worse when she inhales deeply, which is a sign of Pleuritis, which is sericitis over here, right? What else do we see here? 
uh, hematuria. Hematuria is a sign of renal involvement, right? And then also it has, uh, she has pain, stiffness, and swelling, which is a sign of arthritis, which is also, so we have arthritis, we have cirrhosis, we have renal disease, it's already three. Um, additionally, it mentioned that um, she has a erythematous rash, which is the fourth, right? So immediately your, your mind should go towards uh, SLE. Um, additionally, um, it mentioned that she had recurrent miscarriages, right? Recurrent mis miscarriages are associated with antiphospholipid syndrome, which is again associated with lupus. So that should be another thing that should kind of move you towards lupus versus other diseases. Um, another thing that's important is that it's associated with deficiency of complement proteins because those complement proteins are um, responsible for clearing these, uh, you know, these immune complexes that get deposited. And then because they're being consumed, they're, 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 they're deficient in the end. Um, I don't think the nephronic nephritic syndrome is that important for you guys right now. When you guys get to renal, it'll be more important. But for now, just the antibodies are very important. Symptoms are very important. You should know these symptoms because in general, when it comes to these autoimmune diseases, a lot of them can look and sound very similar, right? Like, how do I know if this is rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something like that? And so if you can kind of see what is specific to each one and how you diagnose each one, it, it'll help you differentiate between them, right? So it's like, for instance, if they say photosensitivity or uh, they, have, they could put neurological disorders and neurological, all these, all these things or something and put in the question stem. And if you see all these things together, then it's more likely to be lupus. Um, additionally, uh, a young woman is more likely to be an autoimmune disease uh, rather than like it's very rare in the question that they put like an older man or something like that. All the time you put a younger woman. Uh, anyone have any questions? Sure. Okay. Then move on to the next one. Uh, okay, 35 year old woman comes to visit me because of one month history of double vision, uh, difficulty climbing stairs, and in the case when trying to brush her hair. Of course, if these symptoms are worse after she exercises and they appear after she has the eyes. Typical exams have drooping of the right upper eyelid that worsens when the patient's eyes to gaze at the ceiling of the camera. There is a much more strength in the upper extremities, the remainder of the examination shows no abnormalities, what's the most likely to happen? This one's pretty easy. My senior gravis. Correct. Um, can anyone tell me why this would be Latin root syndrome? So, number E syndrome is, um, okay, not only that, number E syndrome is also associated with other things such as autonomic uh, dysfunction, so if they'll have difficulty in urination, so stuff like that. Um, okay, I find now the constipation, stuff like that, uh, which this patient doesn't have. So, when it comes to my skinny gravis, um, it's important to know where the antibodies affect. This is something that I like to ask a lot. The postsynaptic sertonin receptor versus, as you said, let me use a presynaptic calcium receptor. It's at the motor end plate of the neural ends, which is the neural muscle dungeon, right? Um, let me just do certain, not really important for you guys. Um, what it is is a fatigable muscle weakness, meaning they'll comb their hair, they'll comb their hair, and then as they're combing, every single time they make that movement, it becomes weaker and weaker because obviously the silicone is being used up and it's not being able to be utilized properly. Uh, additionally, if you see these uh, opening for bulbar palsy, so if you just arthritis, dysphagia, problems with chewing, and then importantly, ocular involvement, something we'll see a lot if you deploy the airports and stuff like that. Um, also, most of the time, and not most of them, but a lot of the time, the sinus is involved. And so often what they do is that they'll do like a CT scan when they see someone with mind senior gravis. And then that CT scan will, um, I don't think you do it here now, but that CT scan will, is, is to check for a thigh moment. Um, another important uh, thing with my gravis is my senior crisis, which is an exacerbation which leads to respiratory failure. So they'll probably uh, using their accessory muscles of breathing, low, low, Oxygen saturation, etc. 
Um, now in the past, they used to use a tense long test. Uh, I still think that they still ask about this, even though they don't use it anymore. But essentially, if they give them endophonium, and then if their muscle weakness improves, then it's positive. Um, these days, the bedside test that they do is they put an ice pack over their eye or their eyelids. Um, and then if the ocular manifestations get better after that, then it's more it's more likely to manage synagogues and then they can do confirmatory testing. Um, I don't know if you'll be asked about that, but it's just interesting to know. Um, and then pyridostigmine is the main stay of treatment for these patients. Uh, does anyone have any questions for this? Fairly straightforward. Perfect. Move on to the next question then. Okay. Um, 57 year old man, sudden onset of fever, malaise, pain, and swelling in his wrists and ankles that began a week ago. One month ago, he started on hydralazine for adjunctive treatment of hypertension. His temperature is 37.8. Examination shows swelling, tenderness, warmth, and erythema of both wrists and ankles. Range of motion is limited. Further evaluation shows which of the following antibodies. Okay. So the important thing to see here is that he was given hydralazine for treatment of hypertension. Okay. So it doesn't mention anything, anything like too, it doesn't mention too many things within like the rash or pain mnemonic. So immediately my mind doesn't go towards um, systemic lupus. But what it does say is hydralazine. So if we think that, if we know that this is lupus, right, anti DNA, and this is lupus, and so obviously it can't be both of them, right? Um, this is, I don't even think you guys have taken this. This is uh, like amyloidosis. Um, and then anti Joe, anyone know what anti Joe is? Yeah, associated with myositis. So then the only answer choice here, that only possible answer choice here, would be anti histone antibodies, which is associated with drug induced lupus. So hydralazine is an important cause of drug induced lupus. Not sure how important it is for you, it's good to know, but the more important thing here is to see what the other antibodies cause. So these are some important antibodies that you guys should know. Of course, we went over anti-DSDNA, anti-SMIF for SLE, anti-histone for drug induced lupus. Uh, this is also important, anti-RMP, mixed connective tissue disease. And then rheumatoid factor, which is IgM against the FC portion of IgG, uh, and anti-CCP for rheumatoid arthritis. These are both very important as well because they, they can ask you about these. Um, you guys didn't take scleroderma, so it's not really that important. Um, and then Sjogren's syndrome is anti or anti ra So other, just in case, like, comes some other, like, important causes of drug induced lupus, uh, procainamide can cause it, or, like, the sulfur drugs can cause it as well. Um, any questions about this? Again, fairly straightforward. The point was just to, um, get you to get rid of the other answer choices because these are the you know, associated with lupus and other things that could not be the sensor. Okay. Okay, 47 year old woman comes to the position because of body aches for the past nine months. She also has stiffness of the shoulders and knees that is worse in the morning and tickling in the upper extremities. Examination shows marked tenderness over the posterior back, bilateral mid trapezium, and medial aspect of the left knee. A complete blood count and ESR are within reference ranges. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? What do you think the answer is here? Okay, correct. The answer here is D, fibromyalgia. Um, some things that kind of lead us towards fibromyalgia is, first of all, it's chronic for the past nine months. Um, this word stiffness. Right, stiffness, not really pain, but stiffness and tingling. And then this is very important. If you see marked tenderness over like specific areas, such as the posterior neck, the trapezius, um, and then uh, ESR and, and other like inflammatory markers all normal, then that should tell you this is fibromyalgia because a lot of the other answer choices would have it elevated ESR, right, and elevated inflammatory markers because they're, they're inflammation. Fibromyalgia isn't really inflammation. Um, because like they can get kind of confusing. I put this table from your world here just to kind of go over some of the, because because these because the symptoms can sometimes overlap, and so if you want to go over this in your own time, uh, you can go over this. But just some in, important parts is like we said, um, 
chronic, right? Normal laboratory values, uh, trigger points, which we mentioned, mid-trapezius and, you know, posterior neck and whatnot. Um, and then here we'd have elevated muscle enzymes and polymyositis and audit antibodies. You would have elevated inflammatory markers and polymyalgia. Um, and then also this is associated with giant cell arthritis, but um, I don't I don't know if that'll come. But in case it does, I think it's good to know. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> Four year old boy is brought to the emergency department for a right ankle injury sustained during a fall earlier that morning. His parents report that he's clumsy when he runs and has fallen multiple times in the last year. He has reached most of his developmental milestones, but did not walk until the age of 17 months. He is an only child and was adopted at age one. He appears tearful and in mild distress. Uh, his temperature is 37, pulse 72, respiration 17, BP is 80 over 50, right ankle is mildly swollen, no tenderness over the medial or lateral malleolus. Range of motion is full with mouth pain. His marked enlargement of both caps. Patellar and Achilles reflex are one plus bilaterally. Strength is four, four out of five in the deltoids, knee, flexors, and extensors, and five out of five in the biceps and triceps. The lintica sign is absent. When standing up in lying position, he crawls onto his knees and slowly walks himself up with his hands, which of the following is most likely the underlying mechanism. Okay, you guys are answering it already. Already, The answer choice here is D. So the disease here is Duchenne's. Uh, it's a young boy, right? He's coming in because he's always, you know, falling around. He reached his other de developmental milestones, so he doesn't have, like, a mental um, disability or anything like that. But he does have... Um, a de developmental delay in motor, right? Because you start to walk at 17. Normally, kids start to walk at around 12. Um, he was adopted, so we don't know his family history. And so it, that's why it could be, you know, a genetic cause. Um, also, it says here that um, there's enlargement of both calves, which is known as pseudo-hypertrophy, where the muscle is replaced with fat. Um, additionally, patient crawls onto his knees, slowly walks up, uh, anyone know what the sign is called? Yeah, Gower sign. Okay, I have a picture here, Gower sign. As you can see, he's trying to get up. Yeah, he puts his hands on his knees and then he gets up. Okay, some important things. Excellent processive, causes pseudo-hypertrophy, which I mentioned. You have a waddling gait, Gower sign, which is this. Most common cause of death is dilated cardiomyopathy, and then Duchenne's and Becker's are very similar, except it's this is a frame shift deletion, this is a non frame shift, so they'll have a partial loss of function. So then they tend to have their symptoms longer. So if you see like a 25, 26 year old who's like starting to have these problems, then it's more likely to be Becker's because Duchenne's presents much, much earlier. Um, anyone have any questions about this? Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so, a 70 year old man is brought to the emergency department because of severe back pain that began when he was lifting a box one hour ago. He also has two hour, two year history of increasingly severe right hip pain. Physical exam shows tenderness to palpation of the lower spine as well as erythema of the skin over the right hip. Neuro examination shows decreased hearing in the left ear. Whichever test localizes the left side. Uh, so you study show an ALK FOS of 410, which is elevated. Okay. Calcium concentration is normal. PTH is normal. And an X-ray of the spine shows a fracture of the L4 vertebra. What's the most likely diagnosis? Okay. So what are the things that they're telling us here? Old man is having back pain. He's having he has a two year so chronic history of severe right hip pain. Um Additionally, here shows his decreased hearing in his left ear, and then his ALK FOS is increased while all the rest of his laboratory values are normal. So, <clears throat> anyone know what the answer might be? So, first of all, let's go through the answer choices here. So, what is A? Anyone know what A is? So, A is associated with hyperparathyroidism, right? So, as we saw here, this calcium is normal, 
and his parathyroid is normal. So it can't be hyperparathyroidism if his parathyroid is normal. That doesn't make sense, right? So it cannot be A. What is B? Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, possibly. However, osteoporosis wouldn't have any problems with alkaline phosphatase, right? That's not it's not something that's often seen in osteoporosis. Right? Um, also, they don't often come with hearing loss. Like, um, that doesn't have anything to do with uh, the fractures, the bone pain that they get. So the fact that they're telling us that he has hearing loss means that it probably isn't osteoporosis. We should look to another possible answer, answer choice here. Uh, osteomalacia, vitamin D deficiency. It can't be that. His calcium is normal as well. Um, and then, I don't know if you guys know what D is. D is Paget's disease. Just another word for Paget's disease. Um, possible answer. Uh, not osteonecrosis and osteopetrosis. Um, they can have hearing loss. They can have fractures. However, oftentimes they'll also have you know infections and stuff like because their bone marrow gets replaced. So the answer here is D, which is Paget's disease. Now the reason I put this question here, the reason I put this as the answer choice is because oftentimes they won't give you Paget's disease at the end. They like to use other names. They like to use a second name. They like to use you know things that you wouldn't think of, just kind of tricky. So I thought it's important that you guys see this and you guys know that this is another name for Paget's disease. Um, if you guys look in first day, like you guys look in other places, they don't have this like the, as the name of the disease. They won't have it as Paget's disease. Partially because there's multiple different types of Paget's disease. I mean, one in the breast, there's one you know, one in the bone. So I guess maybe to not get confused between them, um, people like to use this name. But just so you guys don't get confused, it is the same thing. Okay. Um, some important things you want to look out for is uh, bone pain, uh, like a large head, you know, the classic of oh, this hat size increases, right? Deafness, fractures, right? Uh, importantly, um, when it comes to his uh, laboratory values, his calcium, phosphate, PTH, all that will be normal, but you'll have elevated ALP, okay? Uh, additionally, x-ray showing lytic lesions or, you know, because there's different phases, right? Uh, but the biopsy will show the mosaic pattern, which I've mentioned this before, but I can't stress enough. Make sure you know every picture from the slides, especially pathology pictures, because that's what's going to come in your OSPI. That's what's going to come in your MCQ. Those same pictures will come. So if you know them, then it'll make your life so much easier. So definitely, definitely, definitely memorize those pictures. Um, important complication is high output failure or heart failure, sorry. And then osteosarcoma, which was the first question that we did. Uh, very important, very important. Uh, does anyone have any questions here? I'll go through. These are just lab values of different uh, diseases here. So you can kind of see the difference. Obviously, patches, this is straight from first aid. So patches disease over here, as you can see, everything is normal except for ALP is elevated. Um, and then osteoporosis, all normal. Osteopetrosis might have low calcium, but mostly normal. And so on and so forth. So... Lab values can help you distinguish between these diff these different things. Um, in addition to the classic findings, and if they give you the biopsy, sometimes they'll give you the picture of the biopsy, sometimes they'll explain the biopsy. So those are things to look out for. And then they can also ask about the complications. So definitely, definitely, definitely try to try to memorize those. Uh, any questions? Okay, that's all clear. We can move on to the next question. Okay. <clears throat> An 11-year-old boy was brought to the physician by his parents because of a two-month history of progressive swelling of his right arm. He has otherwise been healthy. Medical history is unremarkable, and he takes no medications. Immunizations are up-to-date. He appears well-nourished and well-developed. He's at the 60th percentile for height and weight. Vital signs are within normal limits. Physical exam shows an immobile mass on the right proximal humerus that is non-tender to palpation. ESR is 10, alcross is 35, and x-ray shows a three centimeter sessile bony protrusion, the cartilage, cartilage cap on the proximal metaphysis of the right humerus. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Okay, so again, some of the things you kind of want to look at here in this first 11-year-old boy. Um, a lot of this is, you know, just filler, right? 
Um, but an important thing I want to tell you or want to draw your attention to is the bony protrusion here with the cartilage cap and then where it is. It's on the proximal metaphysis of the right humerus. Okay. Um, so what do we think the answer is here? Yeah, correct. So the answer here is E. And the thing that should kind of give it away is the bony protrusion with the cartilage cap, right? But this is this is osteochondroma. Um again, just some important things. Uh first of all, meta metastatic disease is more common than primary bone tumors. Um okay. Osteomas most likely to be seen in skull and face, associated with different syndromes, such as Gardner syndrome, which um is associated with you know polyps so they get a lot of polyps in their in their colon and then they also have these osteomas in their face so that's an important association osteoid osteoma see on the cortex of long bones again it's important to know the location and then important characteristics right so this is relieved by NSAIDs versus another one which we'll get to which is not relieved by NSAIDs and then osteochondroma which is our answer here right metaphysis of long bones and then it's an outgrowth of bone with a cartilage cap, okay? Outgrowth of bone with a cartilage cap. Um, an osteoblastoma, often seen in the vertebra. This one is not really bad in sense, so that's kind of how you differentiate between those two. Um, chondroma, as we, we kind of mentioned it earlier, um, that these patients are at increased risk for the chondrosarcoma, which is the malignant version, right? And then giant cell tumor, which will, will have that soap bubble appearance, right? And then... It's a uh, reactive uh, multinucleated giant cells, which kind of uh, resemble the neoplastic mononuclear cells. So this is kind of, they might put like something like this as like the answer choice. Or, and then they might say, okay, which the following? Is it, you know, and then this might, like something like this might be the answer choice. So when you kind of, when, you, when you're reading the type of stuff, you kind of have to think about how, how might they ask this in a question, right? So we saw, we saw how they might ask about an osteochondroma, right? They'll tell you about the cartilage cap, they'll tell you about the, uh, where it is, location. Or if they're talking about, you know, osteosarcoma, they'll tell you, you know, they have the cartilage triangle, they have sunburst appearance, stuff like that. So you gotta kind of think about how how they how they might word it in a question. So this is this is stuff that they like to put in the question. So bubble appearance, uh, neoplastic nuclear cells, um, whether or not the pain is relieved by NSAIDs, stuff like that. Okay, these are things to look out for. Um, any questions on these? Okay, perfect. Next. <clears throat> okay, a 31-year-old woman comes to the physician because of a two-day history of low-grade intermittent fever, dyspnea, and chest pain that worsened on deep inspiration. Over the past four weeks, she has had pain in her wrists and fingers of both hands. During this period, she has also had difficulty working on her computer due to limited range of motion in her fingers, which tends to be more severe in the morning. Her temperature is 37... Physical exam shows a high pitch scratching sound over the left sternal border. Further exam, uh, further evaluation of the patient is most likely to reveal which the following findings. Okay. You guys are giving me the answer choice of D, uh, which means that you guys think it's rheumatoid arthritis, which is correct. It is rheumatoid arthritis. So what it's saying here, 31 year old woman. Um, she's coming with chest pain, right? Uh, which is uh, which worsens a deep inspiration, which is um pleuritis, right? Or pericarditis, actually. Um, and then she has symmetrical pain in her wrists and fingers of both hands. Oftentimes they'll say you know DIP sparing or whatever, but they don't have to say that, right? Um, here it's high pitch This is pericarditis. Sorry. Uh, and then none of the other answer choices really make sense. Uh, this is hemochromatosis. This is probably this is uremia, probably kidney failure, or whatnot. But this anti CCP antibody is very important to know the association between that and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, just some other things about it: HLA-DR4, right? So it's aided with, as I said earlier, rheumatoid factor and anti CCP. Oftentimes, you'll have an elevated ESR CRP, which are inflammatory markers. Um, the the a lot of the time they'll say in the question that affected the MCP and PIP and spared the distal for interventional joints, right? 
asymmetric involvement is associated with swan neck and boutonniere deformities. I would uh, look for pictures on that as well because they might just bring you the picture uh, and ask you, okay, what is associated with and then you have to say rheumatoid arthritis. Um, also, this is important, atlantoaxial subluxation, some other important uh, symptoms, rheumatoid nodules. And then this one I put specifically here is because this came on RSAQ and I think it came on the batch after us as well, um, which is the cardiac manifestations. Uh, these are just some I wrote some here. If you find others in your lecture or whatever, um, that's good. But this, this, can, this can and has come as an SAQ, so I would look out for that specifically. I don't know why cardiac specifically, but this is something that you should look out for. Uh, treatment, a lot of times they'll give corticosteroids or NSAIDs, but the only thing that will actually impact like the disease are the DMARDs, which are the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, right? Such as methotrexate or TNF alpha inhibitors. Um, importantly, with TNF alpha inhibitors, is you want to screen for latent TB. Um, I think that's most of rheumatoid arthritis. Additionally, um, the main cause of it is an autoimmune inflammation leading to pannus formation, which is essentially granulation tissue, and that kind of pulls pulls the joints, and that's what gives you these deformities. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this? Okay, we'll move on then. <clears throat> okay, a 55-year-old man, a uh, uh, previously healthy man, has had episodes of pain and swelling of the right first meta metatarsal pharyngeal joint for the past year. These flare-ups usually occur after consumption of alcohol, typically port wine, not really important. On physical exam, there's exquisite tenderness with swelling and erythema of the right first, again, metatarsal pharyngeal joint. A joint aspiration is performed in laboratory studies of the fluid show, show needle-shaped crystals and many neutrophils in a small amount of fluid. Which of the following laboratory findings is most likely to be reported in this mat? Okay, yeah, this is a very easy question. Um, the patient, this patient has gout. So the answer here would be C, hyperuricemia. Um, importantly, it said that this is on his first metatarsal pharyngeal joint. Anyone know what the name of this is? If the inflammation is specifically on the first, um, it's the first big toe, essentially. Okay, well, it's called, it's called podagra. Uh, it'll be on the next slide, but anyways. Um, oftentimes, it's, um, it's caused by, you know, anything that increases uric acid, so either decreased clearance or increased production. So in this case, uh, the alcohol is what's causing his gout to flare up. And then the laboratory findings are very important here, the needle-shaped crystals. And then, oh, wait, I'll just get into a bit more over here. So... It causes TOFI, which is the accumulation of those uric crystals, right? And then if those uric crystals are specifically in the big toe, then it's called podagra, right? It's a classic finding. Um, some risk factors, if they're male, anything that causes hyperuricemia, basically, and then obesity. Um, again, I mentioned the two main causes, uh -huh. decrease, decreased clearance and increased production. So some of the causes of decreased clearance are Diuretics, specifically thighs that diuretics are a very important cause. And renal failure as well. Um, increased production could be because of myeloid proliferative disease, like polycythemia or tumor lysis syndrome. <clears throat> okay. And then underpolarized light is very important because this is a lot of the times what they're going to give you in the question, they're going to tell you that oh, there's negative biofringence or needle shaped or the needles will make show you a picture and it'll be like yellow. All right. I'll just say yellow in the parallel. Okay. Acute attacks. Uh, follow consumption of red meat or alcohol, di dehydration, and whatnot. Now, just to compare that to pseudogout, um, this is caused by calcium pyrophosphate crystals versus mono, uh, uh, monosodium urate. Uh, you might see this pop up. This is a uh, this is a keyword for pseudogout. Uh, oftentimes, it occurs in more elderly patients. So it could be idiopathic. Could be associated with some diseases. Um, classically, affects the knee, but just because this classically affects the knee doesn't mean gout can't also affect the knee. So just because you see a question that says gout, or just because you see a question that affects the knee, doesn't mean it has to be subtle gout. It could also be gout. So keep that in mind. And then the P's, um, it's blue uh, under parallel light, positive biofringence. Um, and yeah, obviously. And then 
it causes rhomboid shape crystals. Again, I beg you, please look at the pictures. Make sure you know what they look like. What does the rhomboid crystals look like? What do the needle shaped crystals look like? Because that could come on your exam. That could come as OSPI questions. It can come as MCQ questions. Um, and it really helps to know what they look like beforehand. Okay. I would focus on patho pictures. If you have time, go over clinical, but definitely patho for sure. Spe like specifically patho. Make sure you know all the patho pictures. Clinical would come second. I I wouldn't focus as much on it. They're much less likely to bring you pictures from clinical. Um, it's important LGD. So LGDs did come as MCQs, and it did come like for instance, I remember we got a question like. What's the most common cause of knee pain? Um, and the answer is trauma. Okay, stuff like that could come. Um, and but I wouldn't say that it came more than like patho and stuff like that. But in general, when it comes to blocks directed by Doctor Arban, this is specific to MSI and GI because he's director of both of these blocks. Is he likes to incorporate a lot of clinical? So he asks the a lot of clinical MCQs, he has some clinical SAQs. So I wouldn't, because um, for some other blocks I would recommend, like I might have recommended, you know, don't put as much effort into clinical, but for this clinical is pretty important because they do ask questions. Um, even like SAQs, he will, he will bring SAQs from clinical. Um, and for sports medicine, I believe he gives a review session. I don't I don't know if he's the same doctor this year, but um normally he gives a review session and he gives pretty much a lot of the important information. So if that's recorded or if someone took notes of that, I'd definitely go for that. Um and also he, he likes to he repeats a lot of questions. Yeah. Um I'll move on to the next question. Different doctor. Okay, so if that's the case, then I'm I'm not really sure. Because a different doctor could mean it could mean anything. It could mean that he doesn't have time to make new questions. But also, like if it's different lectures, then I I, I really I couldn't help you on that. But I just know that the previous doctor liked to repeat a lot. So, anyways, next question. Okay. A thirty-five-year-old man comes to the clinic with acute right knee pain and swelling. The symptoms have been present for a week and have moderately worsened over this period. The patient is able to bear weight but has significant pain when climbing stairs or walking for extended distances. He attempted treatment with ibuprofen, which provided prompt but only temporary relief. Past medical history is unremarkable, though the patient was seen by his primary care provider for a diarrheal illness two weeks before the onset of the current symptoms. Examination shows a moderate size of fusion of, at the right knee. Cultures of the joint aspirate reveal no bacteria, which the following is associated with the patient's joint symptoms. Okay, yeah, this is um, the answer choice here is C. Um, anyone know what the disease is? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's right, but so yeah, so the answer is um, writer's arthritis, or as it's now known, uh, reactive arthritis, because uh, the guy was named after was a Nazi, so they had to change the name. Um, so oftentimes they'll tell you that he had a previous illness, like a few weeks ago, um, and now he's presenting with joint symptoms. Uh, so for the seronegative, all in general, uh, a lot they're mostly associated with HLA B27. That's an important association that you should know. But that doesn't tell you which one it is, right? So where do we see choice A? Uh so choice A, I'm not sure if you took it or not, but it's called hereditary angioedema. Um I don't know how important it is for you guys to know. Yeah, okay. So that so that's that's what that's what choice A is over here. No problem. Uh, so as I was saying, so the mnemonic that you can use to remember is pair. Um, I'm sure you guys already know. 
pneumothorias, psoriatic arthritis, which you'll see, you'll see dactylitis, you'll see the pencil and cup deformity, you'll see the sausage from your toes. And sometimes they'll show you a radiological image of the pencil and cup to allow you to, you know, say what is this psoriatic arthritis. Um, for ankylosing spondylitis, bamboo spine, very, very important. One of the ways you diagnose ankylosing spondylitis is you need an x-ray. You need to see this uh, bamboo spine, okay? Um, additionally, some other things that it's associated with is aortic insufficiency or aortic regurgitation, and then anterior uveitis. Um, what they might say is the person has some difficulty breathing as well because uh, it can cause restrictive lung disease. So that's another thing that can kind of point you towards ankylosing spondylitis. Um, IBD is either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Um, not sure how important for you that is right now, but you'll get that a lot when you get to GI. And then reactive arthritis, which is what our patient had, otherwise known as Rider syndrome. And then, you know, the can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. That's the classic uh, triad um, associated with previous, you know, GI infections. And also uh, another association, which I'm not sure if Arban told you about because he likes he likes it specifically because he had this is be it is also associated with Achilles tendonitis. Um and he might maybe he told you guys the story when he was in medical school or whatever and he had and he had the same disease. Uh, any questions about this? Perfect. Okay. Next question. This one's fairly easy. 48-year-old woman, previous healthy woman, comes to office due to progressively worsening muscle weakness for the past two months. The patient has difficulty with activities such as climbing stairs, getting up from the chair, uh, from chairs, and placing dishes in overhead cabinets. She also reports a 4.5 kilo unintentional weight loss and occasional abdominal discomfort over the same interval. Physical exam shows weakness of the shoulder and hip girdle muscles. Other examination findings are shown in the image below. Further examination or evaluation of this patient is most likely to reveal which the following chronic uh, condition, sorry. Okay, uh, first first thing I want is I want to know what the disease is here. What is, what, what is, what does she have? 48 year old woman, uh, progressive muscle weakness, um, difficulty with climbing stairs, getting up, placing dishes, if weight loss, um, weakness of the shoulder and hip girdle muscles, and then they show you this picture over here. Uh, yeah, so this patient has dermatomyositis, okay? Um, they're giving you muscle problems, and they're giving you uh, dermat dermatological abnormalities. So what is what is this uh, over here? What is this image showing? Yeah, gotron papules. Um, and then an important um, association is with uh, an underlying malignancy. So oftentimes patients who present with dermatomyositis will have some kind of, you know, either GI or very malignancy that you have to look out for. Um, <clears throat> so polymyositis and dermatomyositis are very similar, but if they have these um, symptoms, so if they have gotron papules or heliotrope rash or shawl face rash, or sometimes they say V, V rash, um, then it's dermatomyositis because it's the der derma part and the myositis part, okay? Um, associated with antibodies, anti joint antibodies important, anti me 2 antibodies important, CK. Um, also, it's associated with, so you also should know, like, um, increase in what, because sometimes they ask on SAQ, what enzymes will be increased in patients with dermatomyositis? Does anyone know? Okay, so I, off the top of my head, I can't remember all of them. Um, but I know for sure that uh, creatine kinase is elevated, LDH is elevated, LDH elevated. But I would go back and try and look for other ones because in case this comes as a cue for you guys as well, you should know what enzymes are elevated. Um, yeah, me, yeah, me too is the antibody. So it wouldn't be the enzyme elevated. And then, yeah, as you said, increased risk of occult malignancy is a very important um, association. Okay, next question. A 
A 24-year-old woman comes to the office at 12 weeks gestation for prenatal counseling. She is 120 centimeters tall with short upper and lower extremities, but normal torso length. Physical exam is also significant for depression of the nasal bridge and a bulging forehead. Her husband is phenotypically normal and has no medical problems. The patient knows that there is a 50% chance of passing on her condition to the fetus, an abnormality involving which the following cells is responsible. Okay, yeah, correct. So the answer here is a chondrocyte because this patient has a chondroplasia. Uh, anyone know what the mutation is in a chondroplasia? Okay, now is it an inactivating mutation or an activating mutation? So that's actually a tricky question. It's an activating mutation of GFR3. Okay, this is something that they can trick you with. Um, it's not an activating, it's an activating mutation. Um, the main thing here is things you want to look out for, frontal bossing, you know, short, short torso and then long arms and the head is normal sized. Um, they might have, you know, trident hand, which the hand kind of looks like this, and then bowing in the tibia. But oftentimes I think from the clinical scenario alone, you should be able to answer the question. Now it affects long bones because it's a problem with endochondrial ossification. Um, like I said, from I feel like from the question alone, when they say, you know, toward upper and lower extremities, normal torso length, normal, you know, normal head size, stuff like that, it's not too difficult to um not too difficult to figure out what the answer is here. Um okay, I believe this is the last question. So a 42 year old woman comes to the emergency department because of worsening severe pain, swelling and stiffness in her right knee for the past two days. She recently started running two miles three times a week in an attempt to lose weight. She has type two diabetes and osteoporosis. Her mother's rheumatoid arthritis. She drinks one or two glasses of wine a day uh, daily. She is sexually active with multiple partners and uses condoms inconsistently. Her medications include metformin and alendronate. She is uh, 5'3", 74 kilos, BMI 29, temperature is 38.3, 74, BP is 115 over 76. She appears to be in discomfort and has trouble putting weight on the affected knee. Physical exam shows a 2 centimeter painless ulcer on the plantar surface of the right toe. The right knee is swollen and tender to palpation. Uh, Atherosynthesis in the right knee. The synovial fluid analysis shows a cell count of 55,000 white blood cells, 77% of them being PMN or neutrophils. Uh, which of the following is most likely the underlying cause of this patient's presenting condition? Okay, so let's say you guys already answered this in chat. So the answer here is D, because this patient has septic arthritis. So some things that would tell us that she has septic arthritis is first of all, severe pain, right? Um, it says that she has a fever over here, right? Um, and she's unable to put weight or move her, her knee, right? Uh, additionally, when they did atherosynthesis, they saw massive, massive white blood cell count with most of it being neutrophils, right? Which leads us towards septic arthritis. And then the most common uh, way that septic arthritis like happens is through hematogenous spread. And then sometimes they can bring you a picture um, like the one over here, which is just different ways of um, spreading, right? These are all the different ways, but the most common here would be B, okay? Because this is through the blood, so hematogenous spread. Um, other ways are, as you can see here, with D is direct inoculation or contiguous spread, which is something like if it's right next to each other, then it'll just spread because they're right next to each other. Um, so most commonly called by Staph aureus, um, it's an infection of the actual joint space, right? And it has a triad of fever, joint pain, and then restricted range of motion. Um, usually happens in one joint, most commonly the knees. And then there'll be ro uh, swollen, red, warm, and painful. Always, 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 if you have a swelling in the knee and you think it's septic arthritis, you need to do an atherosynthesis. Um, that's it for my PowerPoint. That's it for the questions. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. Um, in general, MSI is not an easy block, but if you can, because it's essentially three blocks in one, it's the musculoskeletal, 
it's the rheumatology and it's dermatology all in one block. And so you really just need to kind of separate them in your mind and you need to figure out, okay, especially for like rheumatology, because all the diseases that I mentioned earlier, they sound very similar. You need to kind of differentiate in your mind, okay, this disease will have these symptoms. This disease will have these symptoms. And then this disease has these antibodies, this disease has these antibodies. And that's most of the questions will be about those. It will either be symptoms, antibodies, or what is the disease, or like, you know, important associations between them. Um, I think you guys are going to get a dermatology uh, session tomorrow. So dermatology is not easy either. Uh, very important that you guys focus on, you know, what's a vacuole, what's a macule, what's a papule, stuff like that, um, because those are easy marks. Um, literally, the definition from the slide would be the answer choice. And then just the differentiating between different types of cancers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, sorry, what is, could you go back to the tumor, which the malignant tumors are benign? Malignant tumors. Okay. So I'm gonna send you guys. I'll send the I'll send the PowerPoint. So you guys can go over it whenever you want. Um. Again, anything that is different between my PowerPoint and then the what you guys have learned in class, just focus on what you learned in class. Because even if what I wrote is more high yield or more, you know, is more towards step one content, um, that's not what's gonna come on your exam. Whatever you took in class is what's gonna come on your exam, and so I'd focus on that. Um. I didn't put any, I put one pharmacology question, but I didn't put that many pharmacology questions, um, but they're definitely important as well. Um, and yeah, did you know from classes help with stuff like that? Did you show? Um, well, definitely, I would say that some of the knowledge sticks with you, especially if your, if your foundations are strong, then studying for step one will become easier because a lot of the stuff, like you'll understand it faster. Like for instance, um, I like I, we, the last block you take is endorepro. And so if you start studying for step one soon after that, then all the endorepro knowledge will, will already be there, right? So when, if you get like an endorepro your old question or if you're, if you're doing like practice questions, then you will already know a lot of the information. All you need to know is what does, what do they want you to know about it, right? Because because no matter how much you study, um, once you start doing your world, that's where you're going to do a lot of your learning regardless. So it does help in terms of making the learning easier, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just based on class knowledge, you can go and take step one. Um, I hope that makes sense. Never. Never went back to presentations really. Um, all I all, all I recommend doing is definitely gold gold standard is U World. Uh, and no matter who you ask, they'll all tell you gold standard is U World. And then if you want to supplement with like a video like Pathoma, Boards and Beyond, or something like that, Boot Camp, you can do that. But um, because the problem is with the with the university lectures is that they're very specific. And some doctors focus on high yield stuff, some doctors don't. Um, and so it's not really worth going back to learn them. It's better to focus on um, things or focus on these resources that are meant specifically for step one. That way you don't have to waste time learning about stuff that is not important. No problem. Any more questions? Okay, if that's the case, I'll stop sharing my screen. And thank you all so much for listening and participating. Um, if you have any questions, I'll send the PowerPoint, my number and my email over there as well. Um, and yeah, thank you. No problem.